see the, the, the slides? Yeah. Yeah, I do. All right, perfect. Well, um, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start with a quick uh, recap of what we, we saw yesterday about Ken Einstein metrics. I guess so the, the, the context is still the same. X will be compact, complex, manifold, and omega uh, KL metric. I define omega to be KL or Einstein if the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric. Okay, and okay. Then um, we saw that um, a very straightforward consequence of X and meeting in Kell Einstein metric is that X belongs to the geometry of X is very much constrained. More specifically, the canonical bundle has of X has to have a sign. Okay, so either the Ricci curvature is positive, in which case KX is. Uh, Kx is anti-ample, x is final, or which the, the metric is which is flat, in which case x is of Calabi-Yau type, or the last possible case is in the negative curvature range, in which case uh, Kx is ample, and we say that x is canonically polarized. Okay, so um, I guess the, the main theorem uh, that we talked about yesterday was the Yao theorem, an Oban Yao theorem in the negative case, that says that if X belongs to one of the last two categories of manifolds, uh, then X admits a Kerr-Einstein metric. Okay, that theorem has a vast number of consequences. Uh, one of the ones that we saw, the first one that we saw was that um, Fano Kerr-Einstein, uh, sorry, I don't know why I wrote this, just a Fano manifold, okay, you can scrap the KE part, uh, the final manifold is simply connected, whether or not it's Einstein. Another consequence that we saw, uh, some a set of consequences, is uh, the so-called Nyarkayao inequalities. That says that whenever X admits a Einstein metric, so either X is Kerebiao, canonically polarized, or X is Fano N, and you assume on top of that it admits a KE metric, then there's this inequality between the, the first two Turing classes of X and with respect to um, the class of omega to the power one minus two, which might be a, a multiple of C1 of X or just an arbitrary color class in the Calabio case. Okay, and so this inequality is, is very interesting in itself and even more, uh, the case of equality characterizes uh, quotient of homogeneous spaces being the, the two standard uh, space and space forms. Okay, so that's that's roughly where we stopped uh, yesterday, not quite. I, I defined briefly uh, the notion of stability that was also recalled in uh, Daniel's talk uh, a little bit later. So I'll just move on to that theorem that I already showed you yesterday, but let me uh, let me um, somehow summarize it again. Uh, so the theorem is saying that a Kahn-Einstein manifold has a tangent bundle that's polarized stable. Okay, so that's due to Kobayashi and Nuka in the early 80s. And uh, the precise statement is following. Every time a Keller compact Keller manifold emits a Kahn-Einstein metric. So again, it could be either a Calabio manifold, a canonically polarized manifold without any further assumption, or it could be a final manifold that is endowed with a given Kellenstein metric. In this case, then Tx is automatically a sum of stable bundles with the same slope as Tx. And again, even more is true, uh, each of the bundles Fi are actually parallel, which means that they are preserved somehow under parallel transport according uh, with respect to omega. So they define foliations and they are mutually orthogonal again with respect to the metric, the emission metric on Tx induced by the Keller metric group. Um, so this theorem um, is actually true in a much more general setting. You don't need to assume that X is Keller Einstein, just having a bundle uh, an homomorphic bundle that uh, admits an Hermit Einstein trick is, uh, is a sufficient condition. Is the key here is that whenever you call Einstein, then Tx is automatically Hermit Einstein. Okay, because this result is uh, somehow quite important, uh, I've decided to go through the proof with you. 
and show you the main steps. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do now. Let's, let's try to prove this theorem. Okay, so maybe let me go back for a sec. I wanna show that Tx, at the very least, is semi-stable, okay? And then we'll take care of the, the decomposition of Tx in as a sum of stable bundles later. The first step is you wanna show that Tx is semi-stable, and that means that whenever you, you take a subsheaf of Tx, and this subsheaf should have a slope that's no more than the slope of Tx. Okay, so how, how are we gonna prove this? Well, the rough idea is we have a, a metric an emission metric on Tx, that's the emission metric induced by the Kalenstein metric. And that metric on Tx induces uh, an emission metric on any subsheaf, or actually generically on the subsheaf. Uh, and then we can use that metric to compute churn classes and uh, intersection numbers. All right, so here, here's how it goes. Uh, two facts I'm gonna use, the first one, is the reflection of what I was saying earlier than a Ken Einstein metric induces on the tangent bundle an emission Einstein metric, which is a metric such that it's curvature. So what I, I call theta of Tx omega, when I contract it with omega, so I take the trace with respect to omega, I get the identity of Tx. Okay, this says that the curvature tensor of Tx, which is a one-one form with values in the endomorphism bundle of Tx, when I contract the form part uh, by omega, then I just get the most simple uh, endomorphism that's uh, possible, that's a multiple of the identity. And uh, the multiple, lambda, is actually completely uh, explicit. It's given by the cohomology class of omega. Okay, you can, you can compute lambda by integrating, the, uh, taking the trace of the equality and then integrating over x. Okay, second property that I'm gonna use, uh, maybe it looks a bit ugly, hopefully there's not too many symbols involved. It's a, a pretty standard formula due to Griffith, uh, if I'm correct, uh, that's actually very useful. It relates the curvature of a metric, uh, sorry, it relates the curvature of a sub-bundle for the induced metric to the curvature of the bundle itself. Okay, well you can see the crucial point is that if I take a subbundle of Tx, F, uh, so omega by restriction induces on F uh, an emission metric. And so I can compute its churn form, which is a one one form with values in the anamorphism bundle of F. Okay, and I want to compare that to uh, the curvature of Tx. So, of course, they do not live in the same spaces because the curvature of Tx is a one one form with values in the anamorphism of Tx. Okay, so I first have to restrict that to F and then project onto F so that I can at least compare the two guys. And Griffith's formula tells me that the difference actually has a sign. And it tells me much more, something that's much more precise than that. It tells me that the difference between those two uh, curvature forms is exactly of the form beta star which beta, where beta is uh, a one zero form with value in some uh, bundle. Um, and on top of that, we know that uh, beta is zero if and only if uh, Tx splits holomorphically as F plus its orthogonal, okay? So not only there's a sign for the difference between the curvature of F and the curvature of X, but uh, that sign I mean, that, that number somehow vanishes, that tensor vanishes if and only if um, F is homo homophically uh, complemented uh, by its orthogonal complement, okay? So those are the two facts that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna leave them here, okay? Uh, one and two, those are the, the two equalities that I'm gonna need for uh, the rest of the proof. Uh, okay, what do I do with it? Um, the first operation I want to do is I take identity number two, so Griffith formula, and I wedge it with the n minus one power of my Galenstein metric of mu. Okay, and so I just do that. And then for the first term on the right hand side, I apply the first identity to simplify 
the expression, okay? Because when I wedge the, the curvature of Tx with omega to the minus one, um, I do get something that's very simple and that's a multiple of the identity of f uh, times omega n. Okay, so I have this formula here. And now uh, I can take the trace of um, both sides. Okay, I take the trace as endomorphism. So the, the trace of the left-hand side is going to be the first trivial class of f with respect to omega, wedge omega to the n minus 1. And on the right-hand side, if I take the trace, I get lambda omega n times the rank of f, okay, plus the trace of whatever's left. And then I integrate and I get the formula that is uh, at the bottom of the slide, okay, that the intersection number uh, between so uh, C1 of f and alpha to the minus one, alpha is a cohomology class of omega, is equal to uh, r times the slope of Tx, okay, and this is because lambda is explicit and given, uh, you, can, you can deduce the, the formula there from the, the equation number one, plus the integral of the right hand side of the, the, the second summon of the right hand side. Okay, I haven't touched that guy. Uh, okay, and what I was saying is beta, star which beta, is a Griffith semi-negative tensor. So in particular, um, if I wedge it with omega to the n minus one, I get an nn form that takes its values in the bundle of semi-negative emission endomorphisms of f. So point-wise, this term beta star, which beta went from omega to the n minus one, it behaves like a volume form times or tensored with a non-positive emission endomorphism. Okay, so when I take the trace, this is suddenly still non-positive. And so the integral on the right hand side is non-positive, which tells me that the slope of f, which is c1 of f times alpha to the n minus one divided by r, is less than the slope of Tx, which is exactly the semi-stability of Tx. So uh, here I've considered F to be a sub-bundle because it's a bit simpler, but if you have a sub-sheaf instead of a sub-bundle, um, you can essentially, um, okay, it adds a layer of technicality, but deep down it's, it's the same computation. And so the equality case, if, if the slope of f is the same thing as the slope of tx, it tells me that my integral is zero. But my integral is the integral of a quantity that's everywhere non-positive. So it is zero and it's continuous, certainly, so it's smooth. So the integral is zero if only if that trace of beta star, which beta, which when we get to the minus one is identically zero, but because uh, the endomorphism that I'm taking the trace of is uh, emission semi-negative endomorphism. Its trace is zero if only if it's zero everywhere, which means that beta itself is zero everywhere, and which means by what is saying earlier, that um, the orthogonal complement of F with respect to omega happens to be holomorphic, and um, so we have a holomorphic decomposition of Tx into F plus uh, Dirac sum with its orthogonal. Okay, so from there, you can uh, repeat the operation, right? You, you start with a bundle, a sub-bundle F of Tx of minimal rank and with maximal slope, and necessarily that one be stable, okay? And then you write Tx as F plus its orthogonal complement, then its orthogonal complement has maximal slope, and so you can split it again and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is how you get the composition of Tx into a sum of stable bundles just out of that. Okay, so that, that proves the, the theorem. Let me go back to it just for a sec. That whenever I have a Kelenstein manifold, then the tangent bundle is polystable stable with respect to that Keller cohomology class. And better, I have an explicit decomposition of the tangent into sum of direct orthogonal sum of foliations. All right, so that is somehow at the infinitesimal level 
uh, and uses the fact that a Kell-Einstein metric induces an Hermit-Einstein metric on the tangent. All right, let me move on to the next section, which is about global splittings. Okay, so here I've presented to you a, a theorem that tells you if X is Kell-Einstein, then locally, somehow I have an infinitesimal splitting meaning that the tangent splits are the direct sum of bundles, stable bundles. But this is still at the very local level. So you can ask the question, how, when is that local splitting of a tangent? When does it actually come from a global splitting of the manifold? This is in general, a very, very difficult question. Like when do you know that a manifold can be, exp can be split as product of others? Um, this is, this is very, <laughs> This is something very difficult to show in general, right? Um, so let me show you how metric, metric methods can help with that. And at the core of most of the results that I'm going to explain in this section is a theorem that's now 70 years old, almost. That's due to um, Durham in 52. And it's an extremely powerful result that says that, okay, the, the two it explicits, it makes explicit two conditions under which if I have a splitting of the tangent bundle, then that splitting actually comes from a splitting of the manifold cell. Okay, and that's the result uh, that it's uh, in the red box here. So let me spell it out and explain the, the details. So I start from a Romanian manifold, MG, and I assume that I have a decomposition of the tangent bundle as a sum, a direct orthogonal sum of parallel subbundles, EI. Okay, and I'm wondering when does this decomposition, decomposition of the tangent come from the splitting of M? And the M theorem tells you that, well, you have to check two things. First thing is, so two properties, global properties, one, the Riemannian property, you want the, the manifold, the Riemannian manifold MG to be complete, uh, which essentially means that the geodesic balls are uh, relatively compact. Uh, and the second condition is purely topological. You want M to be simply connected. So no, no fundamental loop. Under those two conditions, any splitting of the tangent as a sum of direct orthogonal sum of parallel subbundles can be integrated as a splitting uh, of the manifold itself, okay, an isometric splitting even. Yeah, so this is quite striking result and it has been used over and over again in the last uh, 50 plus years. And it's by no means an easy result. Okay, and it's something that I'll go back to that later, but this is the point right now that is really the result that is really lacking in the theory of singular uh, somehow Kell-Einstein metrics. We don't have such a splitting theorem in the context of singular varieties. I will go back to that later. For the time being, let me spell out a few consequences of this theorem combined with the yellow theorem. Um, okay, so this one actually doesn't really use the other theorem, but let's start with the final case. And let's put everything that we've seen together. So I start from a final manifold, X, and I assume that, that my final manifold admits a Kell-Einstein metric, which again may be the case or not. Some final manifolds do admit a Kell-Einstein metric, some don't. And it's not easy in general to know uh, without any additional assumption whether a given final manifold will be Kell-Einstein. I want to worry about this. My statement is I have a God-given Kell-Einstein metric on my final manifold. What can I do with it? So first of all, um, I can use a kobayashi lupke theorem that tells me that my tangent is uh, a sum of, uh, it is put I stable, so it's a sum of stable bundles. And maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me, let me read out the, um, the theorem. So there exists, or Kell-Einstein final manifold, there exists an isometric splitting of X as a product of final Kell-Einstein manifolds. 
that satisfy the additional property that the tangent model of X is stable with respect to uh, the canon polarization. So this says that somehow the XI are irreducible at the infinitesimal level. Okay, so any final Einstein manifold can be split um, as a global product of Einstein final manifolds that have stable tangent bundle. So no proper subsheaf has a slope equal to the slope of the tangent itself. And the proof, I've already hinted at it, is quite straightforward given what I've explained already. X is Einstein. So Kobayashi theorem tells you, you have a decomposition of the tangent into some of stable parallel subbundles. And why can I integrate this decomposition of the tangent into a splitting of X? That's because of the Ram theorem, because the following two properties are true. First, X is simply connected. I explained that in the first lecture and I recall it uh, on my first slide. And um, second, X is co compact, right? So it's only complete. Okay, so I have a compact, simply connected manifold, that's Ken Einstein. And so by the Ram theorem, the holomy decomposition of X can be integrated as a product of um, manifolds, and those manifolds will naturally be final in Kernstein as well. Okay, so somehow once you have the Ram theorem and the polystability theorem for Kernstein manifolds, then this statement is as a direct corollary. Still very interesting. I am not aware of any um, proof of that statement, assuming only that X is like case table, something like that, um, that would use purely algebraic objects. Okay, um, let me keep going. <coughs> the Carabiao case. So a lot of, okay, it's been um, another central theorem in the complex geometry. Um, so I will certainly explain it and give a, a short um, somehow um, strategy of proof. So let me read it out first. So I start from a Calabio manifold, which in my definition is just a, a compact Kala manifold with numerically trivial Kx. Okay, so C1 of X is zero if you prefer. Um, the theorem tells me that up to a finite and ramified cover, my manifold can be split as a torus times product of simply connected varieties, manifolds, um, that are very special in, the, in how their algebra of holomorphic forms is. I don't want to be too specific because this is not really the object of the lectures, but let me just say that why fall into one of two categories of manifolds? And those manifolds are defined as being simply connected plus having the algebra of holomorphic forms either only non zero in degree zero and in the dimension of X or being generated by a symplectic two form. Okay, so the first category of manifolds is usually called, this is what usually people call Calabiao manifold. So it's somehow strict Calabiao manifold. You don't have any holomorphic forms other than. Uh, constants and the uh, top uh, degree forms, so trivialization of the canonical bundle. And on the other side, you also have a very different geometry, uh, the irreducible homomorphic symplectic manifolds, which are simply connected and um, such that the only homomorphic forms that exist globally on the manifold are powers of uh, symplectic homomorphic two forms. Uh, all right, so how can you prove a theorem like this? Let, let me first observe that as a rather straightforward consequence of that theorem. You have that the fundamental group of X is an extension of a finite group by an abelian group. So virtually it's the, finite, the fundamental group of X is virtually abelian, which is in itself a, already a, a quite impressive result. 
Okay, so the proof, let me um, some highlight the main steps. I won't give any details, but I just want to show how it's a somehow an interesting mix of very deep theorem that do fit very well together to produce this beautiful result. Uh, the first step would be to use the L theorem. So you have a Calabi-L manifold, so it gives you a, a canonical metric, which is which you plot. Okay, once you fix a class. Okay, and once you're there, okay, this is the entry point. You have your canonical metric, and now you can analyze the geometry of X using metric methods and using essentially just differential geometry. Uh, the Keller, the, the Keller part of it is almost like not important once you have the Ritchie-Fine metric. So the first step is given by the Ham theorem. X is compact, okay, so it's complete, but it has no reason to be simply connected. Okay, so I cannot apply um, kobayashi Ruke and the Ram theorem, and I can apply kobayashi Ruke theorem on X, but I cannot apply the Ram theorem to split X directly because X might not be simply connected. So what I do is I pass to the universal copper, X tilde, and this guy is simply connected and Ritchie flat complete. And now I can apply the Ram theorem, I extract the Euclidean part, okay, and I write X tilde as a product of the Euclidean space times another minute. Richie flat manifold that turns out to be Keller as well. Um, and um, a, a very strong result is provided by Chigan Gromon, uh, which is somehow, um, it's much more general than this, but in this context, Chigan Gromon result tells me that once I've extracted um, the maximal Euclidean part, there are no more geodesic uh, lines, and so n has to be compact. Okay, so the universal cover splits as a non-compact factor, which is just the affine space, times a compact piece. Okay, so already at this at this point, it tells me the information that I want that I deduce earlier about the fundamental group of X. Um, the next step is to essentially understand how the fundamental group of X acts on this product CR across N. And this is a combination of um, somehow a Bachner principle and Bibebach theorem that tells me that um, the only uh, compact quotients of CR uh, up to finite cover are given by groups of translations. Okay, so essentially um, this will tell me that um, if I perform a cover of X given by this finite group uh, that I mentioned, uh, then uh, I will split this cover of X as a uh, torus times N. Okay, and the last step is how can I analyze N, the geometry of N? How can I know how many holomorphic forms live on N. And this part, so again, I need to split N according to its holonomy uh, and then use a um, combination of Bachner principle and the classification of holonomy groups, which in this very specific Keller-Ritchie flat case uh, reduces to just a trivial group and uh, SUN and SPN. That's uh, very, uh, constraining and this is why you only see two types of uh, manifolds yi right here sorry appearing in the, my product on the right hand side okay so i didn't mean to explain exactly how it goes i just wanted to show you that the proof involves a lot of tools coming from different um somehow backgrounds or different fields in, in geometry Okay, so we are roughly midpoint of the lecture. Um, now I want to move on to um, single arrays. Okay, so I'm realizing this is kind of a very busy slide. Maybe I could have lightened it, lightened it a little bit. And this will connect with um, Danielle's talk earlier um, when I define KLT singularities using resolution of singularities. So I want to offer an alternative definition of KLT singularities 
that is somehow independent of the existence of a resolution, um, and that has this more analytic flavor. So what is a KLT singularity? Uh, what is an alternative definition of it? On, uh, for a germ of a normal complex space. So I'm going to say that a KLT singularity, so X, is um, so on my germ of normal complex space, if I can find an integer m, and if I can find a trivialization of the mth power of the canonical bundle of the regular part of my germ. So this is a condition, right? Already, this is the first condition in KLT singularity. I asked to find, um, this may not exist in general, an exponent m and a trivialization of the mth power of the canonical bundle of the regular part of x. So again, this is all very local, right? x is a germ, so you can think of x as a, a small neighborhood of the point x, as small as you want. And so once I have this form, this polycanonical form, I can wedge it with its conjugate and take the mth, the one over mth power of it, so it really behaves like a volume form, and I can integrate it over uh, the regular part of my germ, which is an open manifold. Okay, again, I can shrink a little bit if needed, uh, but what's important is the behavior of this volume form near the singular points. So if, when I integrate it, I get a finite quantity, then I call my singularity KLT. Okay, and you can check that uh, if you have, uh, if you take a resolution of singularity of X, then this condition is exactly equivalent to having poles of order strictly less uh, than one. Okay, so having discrepancy strictly bigger than minus one in the terminology that Daniel introduced. Okay, so he provided you with lots of examples, so I won't dwell on that, uh, but uh, finite quotient singularities are one of them, uh, but there are so many more in general, like if you want to find your own example of KLT singularities, you can look at canonical models of projective manifolds of general type, cones over um, final manifolds, and so on and so forth. All right, so, um, I'd like to motivate why people have been really much interested in generalizing all type of statement known in for a smooth uh, projective manifold, a smooth Keller manifold, compact Keller manifold, to the case of projective varieties with KLT singularities or on the analog side, compact Keller uh, spaces with KLT singularities. So they are a lot of ways you can justify um, focusing on that type of question. Um, one way is um, somehow uh, it can be uh, explained using this uh, conjecture. So it's a conjecture that somehow mixes uh, existing the minimal models plus the abundance conjecture. So if you put those two things together, uh, you have the following conjecture that compact Keller manifold with a zero Keller dimension has a bimeromorphic model that is um, that has vanishing first string class and that has mild singularities in the sense that x, uh, x min has only KLT singularities with a definition above. Okay, so in an attempt to classify uh, uh, manifold, projective manifolds, Let's say you have you have those invariants. The Kodera dimension is a wonderful Bayesian invariant, and uh, certainly you can divide um, the world of uh, projective manifolds into four pieces: the one with top Kodera dimension, the one with intermediate Kodera dimension, so between uh, zero strictly and strictly less than a dimension of x. Then you have Kodera dimension zero and Kodera dimension minus infinity. Um, so if you focus on Kodera dimension zero, which is also important to understand in term, the intermediate Kodera dimension case, um, then uh, in order to understand those guys, the conjecture is that it would be enough to understand uh, minimal models uh, so with zero first turn class and a little bit of singularities. Okay, so one question that comes to mind is, 
well, if x min were to be smooth, then we have somehow structure theorem for x min, which is given by the bouvet boulomanov theorem. Okay, and so is that theorem uh, still true for um, Keller spaces uh, with KLT singularities? So full disclaimer, we don't know at this point, but we know a lot of things about uh, similar questions. Um, okay, so I've concatenated a series of recent results and um, so all somehow the theme of generalizing uh, fundamental results known for compact manifolds, projective manifolds or Keller manifolds to the um, to KLT uh, spaces, either projective or Keller. And um, so I, I, as you've noticed, um, the first step in all of the results that I've explained is well, we have a geometric assumption on Kx. Okay, Kx is ample, Kx is numerically trivial. And then out of that, we use the other theorem to find a, a canonical metric, a Kalenstein metric. And out of that metric, we can use that metric to, to somehow uh, do differential, ge use ge differential geometric methods to deduce further properties on X. Okay, so really the first step in all of the um, theorem that I've introduced is the existence of a Kalenstein metric. So I ask the question, okay, now I have a KLT, Keller space, compact with, let's say, first term class equals zero. Is it true that there's a Kalenstein metric? Mm -hmm. And even a better question to start with is, what does a Kalenstein metric on such a space mean? Okay, uh, it's not completely obvious what it should be. Should it be a smooth Keller metric in the sense that local is the restriction of the smooth Keller metric under local embeddings in CN, and that is Kalenstein on the regular part of the manifold of the, of the variety? Uh, well, short answer, no, it shouldn't be that. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated what a Kalenstein metric should be, and this is not the object of my talk, because um, it would take a lot of time to really explain what is a good notion of Kalenstein metric on singular spaces. And, uh, okay, so there is one, at least one, maybe there are others, but we know that there's at least one good notion that enables us to prove a bunch of stuff. And uh, with that notion in hand, there's also an analog of Yao's theorem on the KLT spaces that was proved by Essidieu. I'm realizing I met a typo on uh, Philippe Essidieu's name, forget the I after the D, apologies. Uh, Gage and Zaye, so in 2009, the paper was written in 2006, but it took a little while to get published. So about uh, 14 years ago now. Okay, so 14 years ago, we had the premise of um, Kalenstein theory on KLT spaces. And um, somehow it took a while to eventually use those metrics to deduce ge like really meaningful geometric theorems on those spaces. Um, one of the theorems in that line um, was the polystability of the tangent sheath. Okay, so in the same, in the same line as uh, kobayashi Ruka theorem tells you that a Kalenstein manifold, compact Kalenstein manifold, has a polystable tangent sheath, tangent bundle, well, you can prove that if um, you have a Kalenstein uh, KLT space, so either uh, canonically polarized, C1 equals zero, or Fano, but and meeting a Kalenstein metric, then the same result will hold true. Okay, so the, the actual um, statement is the following one. Um, so it was you know, one and two were um, proven in uh, 2014, so back then, six years ago, and uh, the final case is more recent and joint work with uh, Stefan de Red and Mihai Pound. But in any case, uh, so one of those three uh, main cases of main categories of uh, manifolds, or in this case, uh, uh, KLT 
spaces, you have a poor stability result for uh, KLT, compact KL spaces. And even a little bit better, uh, probably this will, be, uh, this will be playing a role in, in Daniel's talk uh, tomorrow. Um, in the FANO case, you can actually improve the police stability of TX uh, by generalizing a theorem of Tian that says that not only TX is stable, but one extension of TX um, by the um, uh, trivial sheaf um, with, kind of, with extension class being minus KX. Uh, that sheaf may not be fully stable anymore or semi-stable anymore in general if TX is only assumed to be semi-stable. But if you know that uh, X is scalanged and you can actually prove that this extension is, well, probably stable, but let's say semi-stable. Okay, so some sort of strong semi-stability for TX. Okay, so uh, again, um, uh, I would love to explain exactly how, how this uh, theorem can be proved. Um, so most of the ideas uh, from the, the smooth case can be used. Okay, the same formula uh, from Griffith, you wanna use that kind of computation, but certainly the singularities will make everything worse. So you cannot directly work on X with the singular key metric because we don't really understand the singular key metric, how they look like, how they look near the singularities of the space. Okay, so you cannot really do analysis on X directly, so you have to work on a resolution. And even on the resolution, the pullback of the key metric is not any, any better than the key metric downstairs. So you have somehow to perturb it to make it smooth. But by doing so, there's a lot of error terms that come um, perturb um, your equations. And so you have to deal with all these error terms that show up and show that in the limiting process, everything um, goes back, uh, like everything can be run as in the, in the smooth case. Okay, so that's for uh, one result about one application of Kalanstein, existence of Kalanstein metrics on singular spaces. Um, here's another uh, striking application also, or a striking generalization of um, the okay, oh, inequality and uniformization uh, theorem from the smooth case to the singular case. Um, so nowadays we have a complete picture uh, for um, at least uh, in the projective case. You want to you wanna know if you have a projective uh, KLT space, when is it a, quotient, a torus quotient, when is it a bull quotient, and when is it a quotient of PN? Can we characterize that uh, numerically using turn classes as in the smooth case? Okay, and the, the answer is yes, but it takes a, a whole lot of work, uh, in particular one, so several results play a crucial role. Uh, Daniel explained uh, today this result from 2016 where you can extend flat sheaves uh, from the regular part to the whole uh, the variety um, on a suitable quasi cover of the, of the variety. Okay, so this result um, is the, the first result of Grit, because better now, 16 could be used to characterize torus cushions and then generalize the KLT, generalize KLT case by doing Taji shortly after. In the case of ball quotients, uh, you also need to have a, a Miyokayao inequality. So, and that relies on the Kalanstein metric uh, again. And from there, um, they, they were able to, to, to characterize ball quotients by the KLT varieties, uh, let's say, with ample canonical bundle, um, such that they achieve equality in the Okayo inequality. Okay, so this was published in 19, but I think the result itself goes back to maybe 2015, something like that. Um, and lastly, so again, that will be um, probably the content of Daniel's talk tomorrow, a characterization of quotients of PN um, using uh, either the existence of a Kalanstein metric and inequality in the Miyokayo inequality, or um, or just the semi-stability of the canonical extension plus equality in the Miyokayo inequality. 
So I won't talk too much about that because um, you know, Danielle will, uh, will spend a good chunk of time talking about it tomorrow. Okay, um, so let me mention one more uh, application, okay? So I spent a little bit of time explaining um, Bouvier-Bougamer of the composition theorem for compact K-manifolds in the smooth case, and a little bit of the proof. A long story short, it was generalized in the KL to the KLT case, projective case, um, by a series of uh, papers uh, dating back to Duré in 16, um, Greg, myself, and Kevicus uh, a year later, and finally, Duré um, and Pedernal settled um, uh, the question uh, fully. Um, and so what I'm gonna say is, um, maybe I can back quickly. Okay, so um, an analog of this theorem was proved for KLT projective spaces, and let's look at the proof. So here, there are a lot of things that can go wrong, but the first step, as I explained, uh, the choice of Ricci flat metric, um, we have nowadays uh, an analog of your theorem for single spaces. Okay, so the first step, uh, can be sort of uh, reproduced, roughly. Uh, things go wrong in the second step. Uh, the Ram theorem um, works for complete spaces, and the bad news is single Lagrangian metric when you reduce them to the when you restrict them to the uh, regular part of the space, they're not complete anymore. So, any hope of using differential geometric methods to understand the geometry of X or the regular part of X completely collapse. Okay, there's no way that you can uh, use any differential geometry of that sort uh, because the metrics are never complete and which is not necessarily a big deal in general, but not only are they not complete, but actually we have no idea how they look, how they look like um, near the singularities. So if you don't have any information on the boundary, there's uh, no way that you can use global methods from differential geometry. Okay, so this collapses like quite bad very early on. But fortunately, uh, let's say like step five, uh, the Berger Simons classification, the Bachner principle, this uh, eventually survived. Okay, so this is part of what we observed with um, Danny and Stefan. And um, so then we need something to replace the splitting theorem of the RAM. And, they, this, this is where the theory of algebraic foliations came into the picture. Okay, so there's been a great deal of work in the last a decade about understanding foliations in uh, projective manifolds and singularities of such foliations and when uh, foliations can be have compact leaves, when can they be integrated to actually split uh, the variety and so on and so forth. And so using uh, results, so Drubel uh, proved some splitting theorem in that precise case that eventually um, Ehring and Petenel relied on to settle the, the, uh, the full theorem in the, in the projective case, KLT. Um, okay, I won't say much more about it. Uh, so I'll stop here for this. Let me move on to another splitting theorem. So this time not in the C1 equals zero case, but in the uh, positive C1 case, so uh, the case of q final varieties. So q final varieties are just KLT projective varieties such that uh, the canonical bundle on the minus Kx uh, is a positive uh, Q Cartier uh, bundle, and bundle. And the theorem is as follows. You, you start from a, maybe you can, okay, bear with me for 10 seconds. Okay, remember this statement. You have a Kellenstein final manifold, and then you can split X as a product of other Kellenstein final manifolds that have the additional property that the tangent bundle is stable with respect to the first chain class. Okay, and so we generalize this theorem with uh, Stefan Red and Miai Pound to the KLT case. Okay, so Q final variety is essentially a final manifold where you allow. KLT singularities. 
Okay, and the result is that, well, for singularities, we need to allow an additional finite cover. Uh, but up to that finite cover, that's uh, quasi etal, etal into dimension one, um, that cover Y can be split as a product of Q fanos that are again Keller Einstein and that have stable tangent uh, sheaf uh, bundle. Okay, so this theorem works in uh, two steps. The first step I've already explained okay, is this theorem here. Uh, point number three, if you have a Q-fano that's Keller Einstein, then Tx is fully stable. So that means that you have a decomposition of the tangent into the sum of um, stable bundles. And actually those bundles, when you restrict them to the regular parts, uh, they are parallel with respect to the single Keller Einstein metric. Okay, so you, you have this, and this, tell you, this tells you in the, in the final case that on the regular part, you can write uh, the tangent sheaf of Y as a direct sum of foliations. Okay, and better than this, actually, Ogomorov McQuillan um, theorem, another very strong result uh, that had like, major implications over the last few years, uh, tells you that the leaves. Uh, those foliations are actually um, compact. So really what I mean is the leaves of the foliation are open in the Zariski closure. Okay, so on, on Y, on actually even on X already, you can decompose TX as a sum of foliations with algebraic leaves. And from there, uh, so we, we prove a very general um, splint theorem that on any KLT, um, uh, or projective variety, if you have a splitting of the tangent sheaf as a sum of foliations with algebraically integrable leaf that are algebraically integrable, then actually up to a finite uh, quasi tal cover, your manifold splits accordingly, uh, so according to the splitting of the tangent downstairs. Okay, so uh, I don't have time to write down exactly that. And that uh, splitting theorem, but uh, I'm happy to discuss it later if you want. Okay, so somehow when you put together Bovine um, Bogomorov in the projective case and uh, the splitting theorem for KLT, Q final Kel Einstein varieties, you really have the analog of the two splitting theorems that I've explained uh, in the Smith case. Last thing, uh, I think Daniel mentioned it briefly uh, earlier, you have this also spectacular result of Lucas Baum, a very recent, I think maybe early March or something, that says that if you have a Q-Fanner variety, the fundamental roof of the regular locus might not be zero, right? If you take a quotient of Pn by a group acting pre in dimension one, you will have uh, essentially as yes, fundamental group, this group that acts on PM. So you cannot expect it to be zero, but uh, the, the result says that actually it's finite. Yeah, quite striking result. So that's about the recent results. So generalizations, those are all generalizations of the theorem that I've explained over the course of the lecture. Okay, both the existence of Kalenstein metrics and their applications to uh, the geometry of manifolds, how does the scheme generalize to KLT spaces? And now it looks like a lot of, a lot of the major theorems in the smooth case do actually have a good analog in the KLT case, which is uh, quite compelling. And I'll finish uh, my lecture with this um, mention of two, mentioning two open questions. So the first one is, uh, so the bovine bogomorov decomposition uh, initially was proof for compact color manifolds, right? And then the method of proof uh, is completely like transcendental. It uses uh, Kalenstein metrics and differential geometric tools. And yet, in the singular case, uh, we only know uh, we only have the decomposition theorem for projective algebraic arrays, which is a little bit disappointing. And the reason of that is because it relies deep down on algebraic integrability statement for foliations on, um, on, on projective varieties. And those statements are far from available in the Keller um, transcendental world. Okay, so I believe that Christian's 
uh, talk will mention uh, some of those questions in the, in the around the BB decomposition in the transcendental setting tomorrow. Last, uh, maybe one of the major remaining questions in this KBO business, single KBO business, is um, computing the fundamental group of the regular part of the pieces that appear in the single Abovir-Bugamor decomposition. Uh, and conjecturally, as in the smooth case, uh, the pi one maybe should not be finite, but should not be zero, but certainly finite. At least that's a conjecture, and uh, this is uh, this is mainly open, just as question one, uh, as of now, at least as long as I'm aware, uh, as far as I'm aware. Okay, so I, I just want to uh, finish on those two questions, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Do you expect to have any control over, uh, well, not control cohomology, but some space of forms that goes to the Sorry, can you give me that again? I, I, I... Okay, uh, yeah, there was some echo. So is this uh, Bogomolov Bavil decomposition singular? Do you expect to have any control over, say, spaces of holomorphic forms over... Of harmonic forms? So we yeah. Is, it should be the same as, as, as the smooth case. Uh, it's a good question. I haven't, I haven't at all thought of this. Um, so I can't give you a really educated answer, but I would guess... Uh, I would guess that probably the same phenomenon happens, but um, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh -huh. But there is nothing like how long the media composition, of course, right? So it's a completely different story. So, so we have a whole media composition, yes. Yeah, we do. Ah, yeah. ah so you have that. Yeah. So but, 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 there, but there is no uh, Durham decomposition theorem, right? Your decomposition is Lie algebra theoretic in a sense. You mean in the projective case, or? You, you mean it's just foliations? So in the projective it, it, case, we know that we can integrate the foliation. In, in, the, in the compact Keller space, in the Keller case, we do only have foliations, you are correct, and we don't know whether or not they can be integrated. But mm -hmm. we still know, roughly, we know their, the holonomy of those foliations. Okay. So essentially, there's a fat piece and the other piece. The other mm -hmm. pieces have a lot of me, like full of all of me, either S U or S P. Mm -hmm. Okay. So something like like Bochner principle could again be helpful, but actually. Oh, for... uh, the Bochner principle, holds. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. At okay. least for homomorphic tensors. Yeah. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Um, What's the question about fundamental group? So for for the finiteness, uh, it's really um, essential that the singularity is a KLT, right? Yes. So yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, because even like as Daniel explained, if you take a common over a curve, Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, if not, let's thank uh, you again. And uh, the slides will be posted, right? Yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah. And they are already right, right, right. Yes. yes um, Daniel's page. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.